Hello everybody, welcome to the Thursday edition of Video Clips. My name is Julie and I'm a registered dietitian here with Wellness Forum Health. Today I'm going to talk to you about how a maternal diet prior to conception may affect a baby's DNA expression. That's the first article I want to talk to you about. So this recent study was published in Genome Biology and it suggests that a mother's environment around the time of conception could change the function of a gene influencing immunity and cancer, cancer risk in her child. Previous studies have shown that a child's DNA can be affected by um, his or her mother's diet before pregnancy, but they have now discovered a particular gene called VTRNA21 as being particularly sensitive to these changes. And VTRNA is a tumor suppressor gene and also affects how the body responds to viral infections. So small differences in the DNA that makes up our genomes can affect our risk of having a range of diseases. And while a child's genes are inherited directly from their parents, um, how these genes are expressed is controlled through epigenetic modifications to the DNA. And this basically means the external or environmental factors that turn genes on and off and affect how cells read the genes. The most commonly studied epigenetic modifications are chemical marks or methylation, which that's the term I'll be using from here on out, placed on the DNA of genes that can prevent the message from being read. Importantly, these marks can be influenced by an individual's environment. So the present study that I'm talking about today was a two-pronged exper experiment, and um, researchers from the U.S. and U.K. searched for metast metastable epi alleles, and these are patterns of met methylation that are laid down in the earliest developmental stages. And they looked for these to examine the influence of the early environment on the epigenome. In the first part of the study, researchers screened the entire genome of two Caucasian men and identified a gene, that VTRNA gene that I spoke about earlier, as a human metastable epiallele. Using another independent gene, genome-wide screen, they studied the genomes of 120 Gambian infants born at different times of the year, and they further demonstrated that DNA methylation in the infants at this gene, VTRNA21, is associated with maternal environment around the time of conception, and it exhibited lower methylation in the dry versus the rainy season. So both prongs of the study remarkably turned up that VTRNA gene as an environmentally responsive epi allele. Associate Professor Rob Waterland of the Baylor University, who led the U.S. arm of the study, said there are about 20,000 genes in the human genome, so for our two groups taking two different approaches to identify the same gene as the top epi allele was like both of us digging into different sides of a gigantic haystack and finding the exact same needle. So this study was carried out with a population in Gambia because this population's food deter was determined by a markedly seasonal climate change which imposes great differences in the diet between the rainy and the dry seasons. This allowed the researchers to see the effects of different diets naturally without imposing any sort of intervention. And lead author Dr. Matt Silver said by studying babies conceived to mothers eating very different diets in the dry and rainy seasons in rural Gambia, they could exploit a natural experiment. He goes on to say that our results show that the methylation marks that regulate how VTRNA is expressed are influenced by the season in which the babies are conceived. And Silver also added that maternal nutrition is the most likely driver for this. So to, to determine whether maternal nutrition does have an effect on methylation at that gene VTRNA, the researchers examined 13 maternal nutrition biomarkers sampled early in the pregnancy to see if they could predict VTRNA hypomethylation in the infant. They found that low maternal vitamin B2 and methionine levels around the time of conception could lead to low VTRNA methylation levels in the infant. 
and at the same time, low maternal plasma levels of dimethylglycine protected against low methylation levels of vtRNA. So this is one part of the study that I don't necessarily agree with. Um, I think that it was a very reductionist approach to look at these specific biomarkers to determine the maternal nutrition. But that's, I'm just pre presenting the details of the study to you here. So I just wanted to say I don't think that was really the best way to analyze the maternal diet. So to go on here, study author professor Andrew Prentice said, we think that this is the first concrete evidence that a mother's diet before pregnancy can affect the disease risk of her child by rewriting a tiny portion of the epigenome. Because this gene plays a key role in controlling the response to viral infections and offering protection against certain cancers, the potential implications are enormous. The researchers in this study were also able to collect samples from dozens of the same Gambian individuals over a 10-year period. This allowed them to demonstrate that DNA methylation at vtRNA is stable from childhood into adulthood which may imply that the changes they observed have lifelong effects on health and disease. They state that their next step is to follow the Gambian children to test exactly how epigenetic differences in the vtRNA21 gene affect gene expression and lifelong health. So this study suggests that not only does our diet affect our own likelihood of developing disease, but also the likelihood of our children developing disease. I have no doubt that our genes have some impact on many aspects of our lives, including health. However, having a gene is not a life sentence. There is a difference between having a gene and genetic expression. Genetic expression is determined by your behavior and environment. In other words, diet and lifestyle choices, as evidenced here in this study and many others. So hopefully this new research leads to further study and publicity to support the argument that diet and lifestyle factors determine genetic expression and the likelihood of developing disease. Okay, the next study I wanted to talk to you about has a similar focus in um, the way that the mother's diet affects the baby. So according to this recent study published in Science Translational Medicine, a mother's gut microbiome may have a protective effect on her baby's brain development. So the brain is protected by what is called the blood-brain barrier, which is a selectively permeable membrane that shields it from blood-borne infections, toxins, and other things. An intact blood-brain barrier is a crucial checkpoint for appropriate development and function of the brain. It's created by close-knit connections between the endothelial cells that line its blood vessels called tight junctions. So this barrier is so effective that most proteins and molecules cannot pass through, and those that do require selective transport through specific receptors. The blood-brain barrier is so impermeable that many scientists would probably um, hardly believe that the gut bacteria might have the ability to control such an integral part of our neurobiology. The intestines have a similar barrier made up of endothelial cells and tight junctions, which stops the trillions of microbes present in the gut from escaping into the body. Sven Peterson of the Karolinska Institute in Sweden, who led this new study, says that it's known that the gut bacteria themselves control the integrity of this intestinal barrier and that gut microbes could modulate brain function and development. So the present study compared the development of the blood-brain barrier between fetal mice born to either germ-free mothers or those with normal microbiomes. They found that the mice born to um, the fetal mice born to mice with normal microbiomes exhibited normal closure of the blood-brain barrier toward the late stages of fetal development. They tracked the closure of the blood-brain barrier by following a traceable antibody that could be detected in the brain. In the mice of mothers with normal microbiomes, this antibody could be seen readily entering the brain in the early fetus, but it became restricted to just the blood vessels later on. In the fetuses whose mothers were germ-free, however, the antibody continued to enter brain tissue even late in pregnancy. And this problem of increased barrier permeability was associated with low expression and disorganization of those tight junction proteins and was shown to 
persist even into adulthood. That is, mice that were born to those germ-free mothers and that remain germ-free throughout life continue to have leakier blood-brain barriers as adults. Interestingly, they also discovered that fecal transplant transplants may be beneficial for blood-brain barrier development in germ-free mice. The researchers gave fecal transplants to adult germ-free mice containing commensal bacteria, which reduced blood-brain barrier permeability and was associated with increased expression of genes encoding those tight junction proteins. A similar effect was also achieved by giving those germ-free mice bacteria-derived short-chain fatty acids which suggests that the metabolites produced by the bacteria may be part of the mechanism in controlling blood-brain barrier um, integrity. So the results of this study affirm the crucial importance of our gut microbiome, and further, that it may play a role in the proper development of the blood-brain barrier. This could mean that anything that threatens the mother's intestinal microbiome could negatively affect her developing fetus. Theoretically, if these results could be extrapolated to humans, the use of antibiotics during pregnancy should definitely be questioned. In addition, the, the development of the blood-brain barrier is not finished at birth, meaning that it's still vulnerable to damage. So anything that interferes with intestinal bacteria after a baby is born, including the use of antibiotics or delivery by C-section, could prevent the proper closure of the blood-brain barrier and affect um, brain development. We also know that gut bacteria are negatively impacted by many aspects of our diet and lifestyle choices, including but not limited to the consumption of animal foods, dairy products, low-fiber diets, and food add additives, as well as our stress levels and amount of exercise. So this study is yet another example of the exceeding importance of maintaining the health of our gut microbiome. And we know this is possible by, adapt, by adopting optimal lifestyle habits and a healthy diet like the one that we recommend here at Wellness Forum Health. Thank you all for joining me for this edition of Video Clips.